Okay, so for today, uh, we're going to kind of wrap up, just do one quick example of graphing piecewise functions. I want to look at a specific kind of a piecewise function called a floor function or a greatest integer function. And then I want to show you how to use technology to do all this stuff, okay? How to, how to graph all this stuff. Okay, so first of all, let's, let's work backward. Oh, one, other, one thing before we do anything. Is there anybody, and let me know in chat, is there anybody who has, at the semester, has changed into this period? So the period, my period for Algebra 2 from a different period for semester. Type in yes if you've done that. Has anybody switched into period four from a different period? Okay, well then, never mind. We're good. Okay, so we want to work backwards here for a second. We want to, before we did, you know, I gave you a piecewise function and you had to graph it. Okay, this time, let's work backwards. Let's, I've given you a piecewise function, or I've given you a graph of a piecewise function. I want you to tell me what is the piecewise function. We have to write out the piecewise function and then give me the domain and the range. Okay. So we want to fill in this blank, fill in the blanks here. How many rows am I going to have to have in my piecewise function here? Just type it in chat, please. How many parts are there to this piecewise function based on the graph? Okay. Good. So I got to have two rows, don't I? Within each of those rows, I'm going to have to have, so let's say here's, here's my row number one and let's color code these a little bit just so we can kind of keep track a little better so we'll let this part right here be our blue piece of the function and let's make this other part over here let's make this part be red how about just so we can graph it a little more easily so for the blue part, for the blue part, there's really going to be two pieces. We're going to have to have the rule, which is the equation, and then we need the domain, right, for the blue piece. Let's start with the domain. What's the domain of that blue piece of our piecewise function? Where is it graphed? For what x values? What do you think? Delaney Coiner, what's my domain going to be for that, for the blue piece? In other words, what are the x values for which an ant would be standing on the blue piece and not the red piece? Negative infinity. Up to zero. zero. Do I need a bracket or parentheses there? Bracket. Bracket, good. And usually in our cases here, I'm going to write that. I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm going to write that up here. Yeah, let's do this. Usually in all the examples we've looked at here, it's been written using inequality. So now let's take this interval notation and let's convert that into an inequality instead. What's that going to look like as an inequality? X is what? Less than zero. Less than zero. But what else do I need to include? It's a solid endpoint. And you told me a bracket. Uh, the less than or equal to There you go. Perfect. Less than or equal to zero. Good. So there's the domain. Everybody see that? The domain of the blue piece. And now we would just have to go back to unit three and think about our stuff from unit three to use the information from that graph to write the equation of that, the line that is graphed in the blue domain. 
So can we just look, can we inspect this graph? And can you tell me from inspection here, what are the values of M and B? What's the value of B for that one, Ella? What's our y-intercept for that blue line? Devin, how about you? Yeah. Negative infinity to zero. Well, the y-intercept, though. Where does that, that blue line intersect? What is it again? Zero. zero. Yeah, it's zero, isn't it? It intersects the y-axis at zero. What's the slope? One, good, because if I pick two convenient points going from left to right, I rise by one and I run by one, and so it's positive one. We know it's positive because the, uh, an ant walking from left to right is increasing, right? He's walking uphill, so that means a positive slope. Well, if M is one and B is zero, then isn't that just the line Y equals X, one X plus zero? And so what goes up here is x. f of x is equal to, or f of x or y is equal to x whenever x is less than or equal to zero. So there's the first piece. Good. What about the second piece? Uh, Madeline, what's the domain of the second piece of that function? Um, okay, so uh, two to infinity, the domain we're looking at. Of the red line? Yeah. So the x values. Oh, uh, my bad, zero. Ah, there we go, good. To infinity? Mm-hmm. Right, okay, that's what it would look like. And we'd have parentheses. How can I put parentheses? It's open, good. So now, if we want to write that, though, using inequality notation instead. So what, how would I write that as an inequality? x is what? Than zero. There you go. Perfect. X is greater than zero. Yeah. Excellent. And if I look at this line, uh, well, we can do the same kind of thing. Can you tell me what the slope and the y-intercept are equal to? What's the slope of that horizontal line? Hey, let me pass this. I, I've been picked on Madeline enough here. Uh, Olivia, what's the slope of that horizontal line? If it's a horizontal line, what's the slope? Zero. zero. Yeah, the slope is zero. And what's the y-intercept? Two. Two. Good. And I want you guys to recognize here that what if the boundary had been up here like at two or something? If I want to know what the y-intercept is, I can just continue this line as long as I need to until it runs into the y-axis, for example, right? Because I'm just trying to get the equation here, right? The equation of this blue line is y equals x, which is a line that goes forever, but we know that when we graph it in a piecewise function, it actually ends up having an endpoint because it bumps into the boundary at zero, right? Okay, but here we get m is zero, b is two, so then that's telling me that this line is just zero x plus two, so f of x, zero x is just zero, right? So I get the function f of x equals two whenever x is greater than zero, okay? So there's my piecewise function. Now let's write down the domain and the range. Okay, what's gonna be the domain of the entire thing here? So if I look at both parts together, what are all the x values that are included in both the blue and the red parts? What do you think? Are there any x values that are not included? Aiden McDermott, what's the domain here? Well, what's the domain? I mean, think about all the x values an ant could stand on. On the blue function, 
the domain is just all values of x that are less than or equal to zero, right? Anything from negative infinity all the way up to zero, an ant could stand on and be on the blue piece, correct? Okay, for the red piece, if an ant is standing on any value of x that's greater than zero, he's on the red piece. So if you combine both of those, are there any values of x where the ant wouldn't be standing on anything? No. So what's my domain? Say it again. Well, it's infinite, isn't it? Meaning, but more specifically, if I wanted to write the domain, how about if I write it using interval notation? How would I write it? There you go. And if I write it using inequalities, I, all I could say is all reals. Okay. What about the range? Okay, what about the range? Now, the range is different, right? In the range, in the case of the range, what are the y values that the ant could stand on for the blue piece? Let's see. How about, uh, let's see, for this one, Jonathan. So I, we're trying to come up with the range of the entire function. What's the range of the blue piece? Bracket, zero. Okay. And then negative infinity. Okay, so I got to put the negative infinity first, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, my bad. So like that. Okay, what's the range of the red piece? Wouldn't it be just two? It's just two, exactly, right? Because the only y value on the red function is two. So that's what it would look like using interval notation, but let's let's use inequalities instead. How do I say this part right here? How do I say the range of the blue piece using inequalities? Y is what? The Y values go from negative infinity up to and including zero. So Y would be what? Y would be less than. Less than? Equal to. Or equal to? Zero, right? Oh, oh, yeah. Zero for that part. Or, remember that means or, y is equal to 2. So there's my, there's my range. Everybody see that? And there's... That's what would be the inequality? Yeah, that's how we'd write it as an inequality, exactly. Okay y is less than or equal to zero, or y equals two. I need an or in there because there's two separate pieces of that range, right? I have to pick, if I were gonna graph the range on the y-axis, I would have this piece, whoops, rest supposed to be purple. I've got this piece right there, and I gotta pick my pen off the board and go up here to write the other piece. So I have to have an or symbol there because I have to pick my pen off the board. There's two separate intervals to it. I mean, one of them is not really an interval, but you see my point? Okay. So that's, I mean, you just wanted to work backwards on one of those just to let you see it from a different perspective. Okay, now let's, uh, let's go ahead and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump around just a little bit. I'm going to skip this stuff for a second. And let's go up and let's, let's demonstrate how we can we can write this stuff using, or how we can graph a piecewise function using Desmos, okay? So if I wanna graph this function using Desmos, here's what I do. And I tell you what, I'm gonna start from scratch on this. How about, well, let's not. So if I want to graph this function using Desmos, here's how I do it. Well, I'm going to include all the pieces in Desmos in some script brackets. So I'm going to open up some squiggly brackets for the whole thing, and I'm going to define it as f of x, too. I'll call it f of x is equal to, and then I've got this these script brackets here where I'm going to put my function. So each row has to include both pieces of information for that particular row, right? So if we're looking at the top row, 
and let's here's our top row we'll just make this part red how about right notice that i've got two pieces to that i've got the function part and then i've got the domain part f of x is equal to the function 2x on the domain x is less than or equal to negative 2 right and let me even color code this a little bit more like i'm going to even make this let's go like this let's go yeah let's do this i'm going to make this part red and we'll make this part light red oops light red okay so when i put that into desmos oops The first thing I'm going to put in, darn it, is the light red part. So inside my, my script brackets, I'm going to put x is, whoops, got to go inside. There we go. x is less than or equal to, so I type the less than, then it equals, negative 2. And then I have to put a colon to separate the domain from the function. So I, I put the domain in first. Then I do a colon, and now I'm going to put the 2x. Look what it does. It gives me the graph of the, of the red piece of the piecewise function. There it is. It's just the line y equals 2x that I'm only graphing when x is less than or equal to negative 2. So it cuts off at negative 2. Everybody see that? Okay. So what about the next piece then? So let's go down to the next piece. So the next piece is the function negative 1 minus x on the domain x is greater than negative 2 and less than 4. Okay, so let's add that piece. Okay, so to add that piece, I'm going to separate the first piece. I'm going to put a comma to separate the first piece from the second piece. And now I start off with the domain. So I'm going to do a negative 2 less than symbol and x. So x is greater than negative 2 and less than 4. Now what do I have to type? What's next? When I'm entering that middle piece, I put the domain first. And then what do I have to do to separate the domain from the equation, from the function? Anybody remember? No? Okay, I got to put a colon. Colon. And now I can do my negative 1 minus x. Now I'm telling it, okay, so here's the domain for the middle piece. What am I graphing on that domain? Negative 1 minus x. And there it is. Okay, so now for the final piece, the third piece, the bottom piece there. What do I have to type next to separate the middle piece from the bottom piece? What am I typing next? Go ahead, Kinley, say it again. Got, good, I need a comma. Good, then what? Go ahead, Kinley. What goes next then? There you go. Greater than or equal to 4. Now what? There you go. Colon and f of x equals negative 3. So there it is. Okay, there's my piecewise function. How about that? Okay. Now, does anybody see a slight disadvantage? Like one problem with graphing this on Desmos. In a way, our graphs were always better right on paper they were always better in a way because we were able to always see okay there is now I, I filled a bunch of this stuff in on here but originally remember we had a closed endpoint right there and we had an open endpoint right there so we could see on our graph that 
x equals zero is included in that piece and not in that piece. Okay, can you tell that information from the Desmos graph? Can you tell from the graph? I can't, right? You can't tell where those, wh which endpoints are closed and which ones are open, can you? Okay, there is a way to do this though. What are the, what are the, the boundaries between the pieces? What X values? Where would we have to put our vertical boundary lines? At what X values? What do you think, Muriel? Where would I? Ha what are the x values that divide the top and the middle piece, and the middle piece from the bottom piece? The x values. Yeah. Negative two and four. You mean? Yeah. Yeah. Negative two and four. Exactly. Okay. So look what we can do then. We could come down here in Desmos, and we could just graph the ordered pairs. Let's graph the ordered pair x equals negative two and y equals f of negative two. We don't even have to, in Desmos, we don't even have to tell it which equation to use. We'll just let Desmos do that part for us. We want to, we want to graph the point when x is negative two and y is defined as whatever our y value is for our function. So negative two, f of negative two, and look what it does. It attaches the endpoint to the left interval. Well, that's the top one, isn't it? Right? And that makes sense because look, that top one includes negative two in its domain, right? Everybody see that? Okay, we could come down now and we could add another ordered pair at x equals four. So we'll do the ordered pair x equals four, y equals f of four. And that tells us that the other endpoint is included in the right piece, which is the bottom piece, which also makes sense because look, it's got that equal sign right there included. The middle piece has no equal signs, so the middle piece got no endpoints attached to it. So the absence of an endpoint like that, of a distinct endpoint in Desmos, means that those are open endpoints. Everybody see that? So you can literally make Desmos show you the entire piecewise function, including where the endpoints go. Okay? Give me one to five on the Desmos thing. Okay, not bad. I'm gonna have you try this in a second. So let's, uh, here's our, here's a screenshot of, here's a screenshot of what we had, right? If I wanted to go back, at least in my mind, I could add one little part of this that would be useful. I could add the fact that we've got an open endpoint there and an open endpoint there because that's those are places where the, the points did not get attached when we did those ordered pairs, right? Come on. Okay, so that's what that means. All right, let's have let's have you guys try this. Uh, let me put up another one. Okay, so you graph. How about I'll just take one off of the assignment. How about? Okay, everybody try that one in Desmos.
just uh, Google Desmos graphing. So everybody graph that and then I'm going to randomly call on somebody and you get to you get to share your screen with us and show us what you got. Okay, let's see here. Uh, I'll tell you what, Noah, why don't you, you talk me through it here. So I'm going to go down and delete these guys. So I want you to talk me through how I could graph this thing. What am I going to do? All right, so you're going to do f of x equals. Good, f of x equals, excellent. And then you're going to do that little squiggly line thing. I know it's okay, script bracket, there you go. Okay. Yep. Okay, there's the domain of the first piece, good. And then colon. Okay. 2 plus 2x. Okay, good. Um, and then let's, I'm just going to real quick, I'm going to zoom out a little bit here. Oops, I had the wrong, look, I had a semicolon instead of a colon, so it didn't do it. There, that's better, right? Okay. Okay, comma. So we're going to do another piece, so I have to have a comma. Okay. Less than or equal to 5. Okay. Colon, negative 2x. Good. There's my next piece. Excellent. Comma, x is greater than 5. Okay. Uh, colon, 2x. There it is, right? And so if I zoom out a little bit, there's, there's my piecewise function graph. Good. Okay, so now the next part of that, you can see the whole thing. Now for the next part of that, uh, let's see here. Uh, Riley Ducek, how can I graph the endpoints here? What are the X values where we're transitioning between pieces? So like where's the, there's our top piece and there's our middle piece. Where's the X value where the ant steps from the top piece to the middle piece? Look at the domains. For values of X less than negative four, the ant's walking on that top line, right? For values of X between negative four and five, he switches to that middle line that I'm pointing at. So what was the X? Go ahead, sorry. Sure. Okay. Lexi. Where's where's one of the boundary x values? At four okay, you mean oops, no, sorry, that was something different. So questions for Lexi. Can you tell me what's what's the 
what's the transition value? What, what value of X is the ant switching from the top to the middle? Four. There you go. Good. Negative four. Okay. So then let's do an ordered pair. Let's see where that endpoint is going to end up falling. So I'm going to do X is negative four. And then what do I do for my Y value? Do you remember? Exactly. And we can let, we can let Desmos do that. We can just do F of negative four. And there it is. Okay. Desmos is smart enough to know based on the, the piecewise function that the negative four gets attached to the middle piece. It's the left end point of that middle piece. So that's our closed end point. And then go ahead, Lexi. So what am I going to do to get the other end point? I want the ordered pair what? Okay, so the so one one of the transition points was negative four. What's the other one? Five. Five. There you go. Good. So we want the ordered pair five, comma, f of five. Whoops. There it is. Okay. So look at that. So we know that the closed endpoints in our graph go there and there, and that's an open endpoint, and that's an open endpoint. Okay, everybody get that? Okay. All right, so then I want to show this to you on your graphing calculator. Okay, so how do we do this on a graphing calculator? So let me know, who's, who's got a TI-84? Let me know in, in chat real quick. Give me a yes if you've got a TI-84. That's what you're going to be using. Okay, not charged. Okay. It's what you're going to be using in your math classes kind of going forward. So if you don't have one, it's probably something you're going to want to definitely think about acquiring. You'll, you'll be using it in, in college for sure. I mean, you can get by this year without it. However, it, you can use it on the SATs. You can use it on the PSATs. Uh, so it's something that it's worth knowing how to use for sure. So I want to go through some stuff, and you can always come back and watch these videos later. So the way I could do this on the TI-84 is this way. So you go into the TI-84, and you're going to go to, I'll just go through it once, and I'll show you this. So if I pull up my TI-84, you want to get it to the new color edition. It's got a menu on it. I'll show you how it works. Okay, so we're going to go to y equals, and we're going to do this. Okay, so, uh, if, if I want to graph a piecewise function, I can just go to the math menu, and I can go all the way down that list, the math list. So I'm going to stay on the math. In the math menu, I want the math pull down. Go all the way to the bottom, or I can just skip to the bottom by hitting the up arrow. Uh, let's see, where is... Hang on a second. It's been a while since I did this. I thought it was there. Maybe not. I gotta look for it for a second. Is it on the graph menu? Hang on a second. Oh man, I thought it was there for sure. Huh, okay, maybe I'm thinking of something different. Okay, so let's go back. So on the Y equals menu, 
here's all you got to do. I got to cheat and look ahead. I, I forgot, I guess. Well, yeah, there it is. How'd I get to that? I don't get this. It's supposed to be right there. Hmm. Well, I'm going to have to figure this out. I don't know what I'm, I don't know what's going on here, why this isn't working. I don't understand, but two point five five. that's it. Huh. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to skip that part. I'll show you later. You're going to probably use Desmos anyway. You can see what it's supposed to what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to give me that script bracket, but I just don't understand why it's not doing it. Huh. I don't know. Okay, let's go back then. We'll do that part later. So here's the other thing I wanted to show you. And how much time we got? We got enough to probably take care of this. So there's one special kind of piecewise function. It's called the greatest integer function, which is it's a whole bunch of it's infinite number of pieces that are going to get graphed. And here's what it looks like. The greatest integer function, it looks like f of x equals, and then it's like this, kind of like this double struck square bracket. That's the notation for it. So that symbol means the greatest integer function, which means that when I input a value of x, the output is always going to be the greatest integer that's less than or equal to my input value. Now, a lot of times this is called a floor function. Okay, so let's try a couple examples with this. If I input a 7, what's the greatest integer that's less than or equal to 7? And think what an integer is. What's an integer real quick? Remind us what an integer is. Uh, let's see, Devin Driscoll, what's an integer? Going clear back to the very beginning of the year, what do we mean by an integer? Okay, so everyone pay close attention because we got to know this. Ethan, what's an integer? It's a positive or negative whole number, right? So it's any number that, any fraction that has a one on the bottom, positive or negative, is an integer, right? So what's the greatest integer that's less than or equal to seven? Ethan, what's that going to be? What was the question? What's, I want to plug this into my greatest integer function. If f of x is my greatest integer function, what's the greatest integer for an input of 7? If I put 7 into this function, it's going to output the greatest integer less than or equal to 7. Uh, it, but greatest integer less than or equal to 7. So it would be 7, exactly, right? Okay, what about f of 2.3? What's the greatest integer that's less than or equal to 2.3, Aiden McDermott? What's the greatest integer that's less than or equal to 2.3? Aiden McDermott, help me out here. Uh, B. What's f of 2.3? So if I put 2.3 into my greatest integer function, what's the output going to be? What's the greatest integer that's less than or equal to 
Well, 2.3 is not an integer, right? Integer is a positive or negative whole number. Two, it's two, exactly. We'd have to, we'd have to uh, round down to a two, wouldn't we? And that's really all we're doing. When we input a number into the greatest integer function, we're just always going to round down the value to the nearest integer, unless it already starts on an integer, and then we stay there, right? So how about this one then? What's If I input a negative 4.8 into the greatest integer function, this is a tricky one. Aiden Bork, what's my output going to be? What? So we're doing part C. If I input a negative 4.8 into my greatest integer function, what's the output going to be? Um. <laughs> so when we input, when we put a number into a greatest integer function, we're always just going to round down to the nearest integer. So think oh, so on five? negative five, oh, right? Round down. Yeah, so it'd be okay. negative five. We're going to round down. What's the next integer that's less than uh, or equal to negative 4.8? We'd have to scoot it to the right to negative five. There's a way you can kind of think about this. Okay, if, if you think about this on a number line, this is helpful, right? If I think about this on a number line, so there's zero. These are all my integers, right? Zero, one, two, three negative one, negative two, negative three. Think about it, think about the x-axis or the, or the number line as just being an infinite piece of string with knots tied at all of the integers, right? Like if I want to calculate what's the greatest integer of negative 4.8, then that's like saying, I'm going to put a bead on the string at negative 4.8, which is like right there, right? And I'm just going to slide the bead to the left as far as I can until it hits a knot. Well, it's just going to slide to the left until it hits negative 5, right? I'm just rounding down to negative 5. Now, that's kind of a good way to think about it. Okay, how about, um, what if we tried something here like we made it a little different? What if we made our function f of x is the greatest integer function of x minus 5? Okay, now what's f of 9 going to be? If I'm plugging 9 in for x in this function, what am I going to get? Inside the greatest integer function, I'm going to end up with a 9 minus 5. Well, what's 9 minus 5? Delaney Coiner. 4. Okay, so if I feed a 4 into my greatest integer function, what's the output going to be? Mm, no, remember when I'm, when I'm feeding a value into the greatest integer function, I'm always just going to round down to the nearest integer. Well, 4 is already an integer though, isn't it? Right? I'm getting the greatest integer of 4 which is, that's just four, right? Because it's already an integer. The greatest integer that's less than or equal to four is four. Okay, let's try another one. So Delaney, what about if I plug in a 0.5? So I'm plugging 0.5 in for X. What's 0.5 minus five equal to? I'll put you on the spot. Negative 4.5. Okay, so that's what's going inside my greatest integer function. So then what's the greatest integer function evaluated at negative 4.5? Negative five. Negative five, exactly. We're gonna have to round down to the nearest integer. Well, if I round down from negative 4.5, I'm gonna push that to the next negative number. The next negative number that's less than negative 4.5 is negative five, right? Everybody see that? Okay. How about f of negative 8.1? So if I'm, I'm going to plug in negative 8.1 in for x, Jacob, I'm going to put you on the spot here. What's negative 8.1 minus 5?
13.1. Yeah, negative 13.1, okay. So if that's what I'm inputting into the greatest integer function, what's my output going to be? I've got to push that along the string to the left as far as it'll go, right? Negative 13.1 is just a little bit on my number line. That's just a little bit to the left of negative 13. It'd be like right here, wouldn't it? Right, so what's the next integer that's less than or equal to negative 13.1? Jacob? Negative 14. There you go. Negative 14, you got it. Okay, so everybody sees how we use that function. Okay, now what's it look like? Okay, well, let's, rather than using a table, let's just cheat and use Desmos for this. How about? Okay, so let's. Let's pull up Desmos here. And if I put in the greatest integer function. OK, so how do I do that? Well, in Desmos, we have to call it. It doesn't use greatest integer function. It uses a floor function. So I'm going to do f of x equals floor of x. And look what it does. Look at that. Okay, so it just creates a stair step, doesn't it? Right? It creates a stair step where, think about it, makes sense, doesn't it? Because for every, let's zoom in a little bit more on this. For every value of x between 0 and 1, it's going to round down to 0. So if I'm inputting any value less than 1 that's greater than or equal to 0 and less than 1, the y value gets pushed down to zero. But as soon as I get up here to one, then all of a sudden, now we're going to jump up a step, right? Because now, oh, that's not going to work, is it? Here, let me, let me take a picture of that. That'll work best. Okay, so there's my greatest integer function. Okay, so if I wanted to put endpoints on this, if I input 0, I get back 0. If I input 0.5, I get back 0. If I input 1, I get 1, right? If I input 1.5, I get 1. If I input 2, it jumps me up to 2. So it ends up looking like that. That's what my function ends up looking like, isn't it? Right? It's just an infinite stair step. Sometimes we call this a step function, literally. Okay, that's what it looks like. All right, we'll wrap this up. You should be able to do pretty much the entire assignment. I'll probably spend like 10 minutes wrapping up a few, a few final points on this, and we'll jump on to the next stuff next time. I'll push the assignment due date out a little bit, though, just so you have, make sure you have time to finish this very long section. Okay, I'll be here after school if you have questions. I uh, need some help with anything. I'll be here till about 2.50, then I've got a meeting. Uh, otherwise, I will see you on Wednesday. Have a great day.